Chapter 6, the atomic structure and chemical bonds can be found on page 160 and 161. We're going to learn all about the, what we know so far about atoms, their, the nucleus, protons, electrons, and how they're structured and how that actually is a indicator of how those atoms and specific elements are going to react with different things and form different types of bonds and activities. Well, to get into that, we're going to answer the question that is posed to us in our launch lab here on page 161. It says, model the energy of electrons, because the electrons are the biggest players in terms of how the elements and atoms are going to react with one another. It's time to clean up your room. You've probably heard this before, and you will think, oh, again? Where do all these things come from? At one point, your room was nice and clean, and now somehow you got destroyed, and it probably doesn't take too long every time that you clean it to get back to that level of uncleanliness. Some are made of cloth, the things in your room. Some are made of wood. Books are made of paper. And there's this endless array of things made of plastic. Fewer than 100 different kinds of naturally occurring elements are found on Earth. They combine to make all these different substances. But the question we're asking today is what makes elements form chemical bonds with other elements to make all these different things? How do we get all these different cool items from these really specific elements that are on the periodic table? Well, to model this, we're going to take a look at a magnet and a paper clip. Here it asks us in our directions, number one you can see on the screen and also in your book, pick up a paper clip with a magnet and touch that paper clip to another paper clip to pick it up. So I've got this, this little magnet here, it's pretty strong, picks up this paper clip relatively easily and attaches right at the end. Now I'm going to use this to pick up another paper clip that I have right here on my desk. Because the magnet is now attached to this piece of metal, this paper clip, it actually makes this piece of metal magnetic as well and then turns into a magnet that can pick up another paper clip. It says, number two, continue picking up paper clips until you cannot pick up any more. I got a third one here that if the magnet is strong enough will allow us to magically pick up. Awesome. Number three says, then gently pull off the paper clips one by one. Now I want you to notice the difference between how these things come off because it's going to be really important to us understanding how electrons interact based on where they are positioned away from and or close to the nucleus. So this first paper clip, if I grab it, pull on a little bit, came off really, really easily. Next, second paper clip, a little bit closer to the magnet, pull, 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 and it's almost like it wants to stay attached. Came off quite a bit more difficult. In the third one, it's attached to that magnet. If I pull it off, it still wants to go back and reattach, as in there's a really strong force compared to those other two. Now, if we look at what this actually means for an atom, you're going to answer these two questions. Which paperclip was the easiest to remove? Well, that was the one that was furthest away. It was the farthest away from that magnetic source, therefore it had the least attractive force on it, making it the easiest to remove. Second question says, which paperclip was the hardest to remove? Well, obviously that was the one that was right attached to that attractive force. So the closer you are to that attractive force, the harder it is to remove. The further away you are from that attractive force, the easier it is to remove. Now, I wonder if that relates to the model of atoms and how those electrons behave as their attractive force is the nucleus. See the nucleus has an overall positive charge and the electrons surrounding it have a negative charge. We say opposites attract because those are going to be attractive forces pulling each other together. Now answer this question. Which electrons are the easiest to remove and which electrons are the hardest to remove? Electrons, they're, as you're going to learn, actually position themselves in different levels away from the nucleus. The ones that are closest to the nucleus, closest to that attractive force like we just modeled, are the hardest to remove. The ones that are furthest away from the nucleus, the furthest away from that attractive force, are the easiest to remove. So the elements that have electrons that are further away from the nucleus are going to be maybe more reactive. The ones that are really close to that nucleus and have more of an attractive force are probably going to be less reactive because it's more difficult to remove those for those chemical bonds to be uh, broken and or started with different types of elements. So in this example here you've got a carbon atom. It's got six protons and neutrons and six electrons. These first two electrons are really close to the nucleus. They're in the first energy level and they're going to be hard to remove. These other four however are going to be easier to interact with because they're further away from the nucleus. This understanding is going to be key to understanding how atomic structure works, how each element has a specific structure based on the number of protons and electrons it has, and then specifically how those electrons interact based on how far they are from that nucleus. Again, further away, easier to remove, closer together, more of those attractive forces hold them 
together. Let's jump into our lesson on page 162. Chapter 6 begins on page 160. It's all about the atomic structure and chemical bonds. We're on page 162 for section 1, Why Do Atoms Combine? Our objectives for today are listed on that left-hand side. It says that scholars will identify how electrons are arranged in an atom. Scholars will compare the relative amounts of energy of electron in an atom. Scholars will compare how the arrangement of electrons in an atom is related to its place on the periodic table. See, back in what was chapter 3, we learned about the simplest form of matter and we started to ad identify the model for an atom and how an atom is developed. Now we're going to go back and kind of build more on that understanding of atomic structure because this picture right here is what we've come to understand. We've got inside the center of this model of an atom, the nucleus that has the positively charged protons and the neutral neutrons. We know that the electrons exist outside of that nucleus and those electrons have a negative charge. Now based on what we know, we're going to try and understand a little bit more about this atomic structure and then why atoms are actually going to react and do the things that they're going to do based on how they're built and how they're structured. Another picture that identifies each of those different parts is shown here. The nucleus contains the protons and neutrons in the center. The electrons are the negatively charged particles that are moving around the nucleus. And sometimes it's depicted and shown in this way in which they're kind of in these circles or energy levels. But in reality, they're existing in what's called electron clouds, kind of floating around and not having a defined space. They're moving in all different directions surrounding that positive center. Because the center is positive and the electrons on the outside are negative, they're naturally drawn towards each other. Now, based on how many protons and how many neutrons and how many electrons a atom might have might determine its ability to kind of carry out certain types of properties or certain types of actions. So we're going to take a look at the relationship between how the structure of an atom relates to how that atom behaves or reacts in the universe. Atomic structure. Page 162. When you look at your desk, you probably see it is as something solid. You might be surprised to learn that all matter, even solids like wood and metal, contain mostly empty space. How can this be? The answer is that although there might be little or no space between atoms, a lot of empty space lies within each atom. At the center of every atom is a nucleus containing protons and neutrons. This nucleus represents most of the atom's mass. The rest of the atom is empty except for the atom's electrons, which are extremely small compared with the nucleus. Although the exact location of any electron cannot be determined, the atom's electrons travel in an area of space around the nucleus called the electron cloud. To visualize an atom, picture the nucleus as the size of a penny. In this case, electrons would be smaller than the grains of dust and the electron cloud would extend outward as far as 20 football fields. So the size of a penny is your nucleus, 20 football fields away is where those electrons could be. There's a ton of empty space in our understanding of how an atom is put together. Electrons. You might think that electrons resemble planets circling the sun, but they are very different. As you can see in figure one, first planets have no charge, but the nucleus of an atom has a positive charge, and the electrons have negative charges. Second, planets travel in predictable orbits. You can calculate exactly where one will be at any time, but this is not true for electrons. Although electrons do travel in predictable areas, it is impossible to calculate the exact position of any one electron. Instead, scientists use a mathematical model that predicts where an electron is most likely to be. Element structure. Each element has a unique atomic structure consisting of a specific number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The number of protons and electrons is always the same for a neutral atom of a given element. Figure 2 shows a two-dimensional model of an electron structure of lithium. This lithium atom, which has three protons and four neutrons in its nucleus and three electrons moving around its nucleus. Now, most of the time when we identify neutral atoms, we know that a positive and negative charge will cancel each other out, so the same number of protons in a given element is usually the same number of electrons in that element. The number of neutrons is sometimes the same, but as we learned back in our understanding and learning of isotopes, they can have a different number of neutrons that give you a different version of that element. Still the same material, just a, maybe a different way in which it's weighted and it reacts. Electron arrangement on page 163. The number and arrangement of electrons in an electron cloud of an atom are responsible for many of the physical and chemical properties of that element. Electron energy. Although all the electrons in an atom are somewhere in the electron cloud, some electrons are closer to the nucleus than others. The different areas for an electron in an atom are called 
Energy levels. The number of electrons. Each energy level can hold a maximum number of electrons. The farther an energy level is from the nucleus, the more electrons it can hold. The first energy level, energy level 1, can hold 1 or 2 electrons. The second energy level, energy level 2, can hold up to 8. The third can hold up to 18, and the fourth energy level can hold a maximum of 32 electrons. So you've got electrons arranged in different energy levels at different distances from the nucleus based on how many electrons there are in the atom. The farther an energy level is from the nucleus, the more the electrons it can hold. Lastly, the electrons in the level closest to the nucleus have the lowest amount of energy. Electrons in the that are farther from the nucleus have the highest amount of energy, which then relates to what we learned in our opening simulation or our opening kind of observations, that electrons that are closest to the nucleus have the lowest level of energy because they're happiest, they're closest to that positive charge. The electrons that are furthest away are actually a lot more loosely held together by that positive charge and can have a lot more energy and move around. Those are also the ones that are easier to remove or easier to be shared or displaced based on how that element or how that atom is going to react. Let's take a look at those energy steps on page 164. The energy levels that it described at the bottom of page 163 said that in the first energy level, the you can hold two electrons. In the second energy level, you can hold up to eight electrons. The third can hold up to 18, and the fourth energy level can hold a maximum of 32. So two, eight, 18, and 32. That's how many electrons can be in those different levels or clouds that's kind of shown on page 164. Here it is again, the energy steps. The stairway shown in figure four is a model that shows the maximum number of electrons each energy level can hold in the electron cloud. Think of the nucleus as being at the floor level. Electrons with, within an atom have different amounts of energy represented by energy levels. These energy levels are represented by the stair steps in figure four. Electrons in the level closest to the nucleus have the lowest amount of energy and are said to be in an energy level one. Electrons farther from the nucleus have the highest amount of energy and are the easiest to remove. To determine the maximum number of electrons that can occupy an energy level, use the formula 2n squared, where n equals the number of the energy level. Recall the launch lab at the beginning of the chapter. It took more energy to remove the paperclip that was closest to the magnet than it took to remove the one that was farthest away. That's because the closer a paperclip has to the magnet, the stronger the magnet's attractive force was on the clip. Similarly, the closer a negatively charged electron is to the positively charged nucleus, the more strongly it is attached to the nucleus. Therefore, removing electrons that are close to the nucleus takes more energy than removing those that are farther away from the nucleus. The question here in our reading check says, what determines the amount of energy an electron has? It would be its proximity to the nucleus, how close it is to that actual uh, nucleus, to that positive charge. What's our formula for figuring out the number of energy steps? The formula is listed in the middle of the first paragraph on page 164. It says, to determine the maximum number of electrons that can occupy an energy level, use the formula 2n squared where n equals the number of the energy level. So if you take one, plug it in, one squared is one times two, the first energy level can have two. Two squared times two is four, times two is eight, can have eight in that second level. And then you would get 18 and 32, and you could continue with that if you were to pick a much larger element that has many more protons and therefore many more electrons to figure out how many energy levels that would have, uh, or how many electrons it could hold in each of those energy levels. Periodic table and energy levels. The periodic table includes a lot of data about the elements and can be used to understand the energy levels also. Look at the horizontal rows or periods in the portion of the table shown in figure five. Recall that the atomic number for each element is the same as the number of protons in that element and that number of protons equals the number of electrons because an atom is electrically neutral. Therefore, you can determine the number of electrons in an atom by looking at the atomic number written above each element symbol. So, Data from the periodic table can be used to understand these energy levels. The way in which the, the periodic table is organized shows us what's going on in each energy level because it tells us the number of protons, and therefore if it's neutral, we know the number of electrons. The number of electrons in an element outermost energy level increases as you go from left to right on your periodic table. And we're going to break that down in this next section called the electron configurations on page 165. If you look at the periodic table shown in figure five, you can see that the elements are arranged in a specific order. 
The number of electrons in a neutral atom of the element increases by one from left to right across the period. For example, the first period consists of hydrogen with one electron and helium with two electrons in energy level one. Recall from figure four that energy level one can hold up to two electrons. Therefore, helium's outer energy level is complete. Atoms with a complete outer energy level are stable. Therefore, helium is stable. Any element that has a stable energy level, like its outer energy level is completely full, it's not going to want to react with anybody else because it's completely happy and doesn't need to do anything in order to um, have that energy level filled. The next paragraph. The second period begins with lithium, which has three electrons, two in energy level one, one in energy level two. Lithium has one electron in its outer energy level. To the right, lithium is beryllium with two outer level electrons, boron with three, and so on, until you reach neon with eight. So our periodic table has this big section in the middle called the transition metals. On the outside, you have the numbers that are counting in those vertical columns. Let's go to uh, an example of the periodic table and what that looks like, and then I'll go back. So here, you've got column one, two, three, and it has the numbers listed right on the top here. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and then you have 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Now, those numbers indicate how many electrons are actually in the outermost energy level. So in level one, all of these elements have one electron in their outermost energy level. In column two, all of these elements have two electrons in their outermost energy level. Then we're going to skip over all these transition metals because they act and behave a little bit differently. And we go over here to group 13. In group 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, I want you to just think about and look at the last number in that digit. You've got 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Now all of those numbers, that last number indicates how many electrons are in that outermost energy level. So for boron it's 3, for carbon it's 4, for nitrogen it's 5, for oxygen it's 6, for fluorine it's 7, and for helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon has 8. All of these over here are called our noble gases. They're noble because they're all by themselves. They don't ever need to react with anything because they have a full outer energy level. All of these other elements have a way in which they don't have an outer energy level that's full of electrons, and they're going to want to be more reactive. Okay? Back to electron configuration. Look again at figure four. You'll see the energy level two can hold up to eight electrons. Not only does neon have a complete outer energy level, but also has this configuration of exactly eight electrons in an outer energy level. This is stable. Therefore, neon is stable. The third period elements fill the outer energy level in the same manner, ending with argon. Although energy level 3 can hold up to 18 electrons, argon has 8 electrons in its outer energy level, a stable configuration. Each period in the periodic table ends with a stable element. So if I were to ask you to fill in the number of electrons that each of these atoms has in its outer energy level, we would use what we learned from the periodic table to fill in these numbers. So hydrogen is in column 1. It has one electron in its outer energy level. Lithium is in column one. It has one electron in its outer energy level. Even though lithium's overall atomic number is three, that means it's got two in its first level and one in the outermost level. The next is beryllium. This has a total of four electrons. Two are on the innermost level. Two would then be in the outer level. Go all the way across the periodic table to boron. Boron is number five on your periodic table, so it's got five protons, five electrons. Two of those five electrons are in their innermost level. Three of those electrons are in the outer level. And it continues. Carbon would have four in the outer level. Nitrogen would have five in the outer level. Oxygen would have six in the outer level. Fluorine would have seven in the outer level. And then helium and neon are those that have the exact amount necessary to have a stable outer level. Helium has two and neon has eight. So helium is the only exception that doesn't follow this rule of the number indicating how many electrons are in that outermost level. Again, to summarize the electron configuration, we have to look at each element, and that element gives us on the periodic table its atomic number. That atomic number tells us the number of protons, and we're assuming that the number of protons is always equal to the number of electrons. So if you know the element, you know the atomic number by looking at the periodic table, you know how many electrons are in that element. And you have to start using... Um, this process of elimination to fill up the different energy levels to think how many of those electrons exist in each level. If you're using, let's give for example oxygen because it's obviously really important to what we're, we breathe and important to life, that it's a commonly known element. Oxygen has a total of 
eight electrons because its atomic number is eight. It's got eight protons. Two of those electrons are in the innermost level. Therefore, there are six other electrons in the next level. Well, what happens, Mr. Shane, if you've got a really big um, element? Let's talk about, let's say, chlorine, like the chemical that's put into pools. Chlorine has atomic number of 17. Therefore, it's got 17 electrons. It's got two electrons in its first energy level. Then it's got eight in the next level. Now, if you add those together, two plus eight is 10. Therefore, it's going to have seven more in that outer level. Because chlorine is in column 17, you could predict that by looking at the periodic table itself, or you could look at this chart and say, well, it's got a total of 17, and then you count to fill up each of those different levels. So two would be in the first, eight would be in the second, and then there's seven left over from a total of 17, and you would populate those different electrons in those levels according to, again, the number of protons that it has. That brings us to this next question to check our understanding. Analyze the relationship of the atomic number of a neutral atom to the number of electrons and protons it contains. The atomic number, the number that's on our periodic table for each element, tells us how many protons, protons there are. The number of protons, if it's a neutral element, is exactly equal to the number of electrons. So from the number of protons, we find the number of electrons, and that tells us how many electrons there are in that element. Then we can go back to our chart and say, well, I know where all of those electrons should exist because I know how many electrons are in that element. You can also use the periodic table to make that prediction based on the columns that those elements fall into. Hope that helps with your understanding in that portion. The last bit of our learning today is all about element families. And just like your family that ha might have a bunch of things in common or you might look like each other, you might have a resemblance of one another, elements have this resemblance of one another as well based on the number of protons and electrons that they have because they're going to have similar levels of reactivity. Let's read through page 166 and 167 to wrap up our learning for part one of lesson one in chapter six, element families. Elements can be divided into groups or families. Each column of the periodic table in figure five contains one element family. Hydrogen is usually considered separate, so the first element family begins with lithium and sodium in the first column. The second family starts with beryllium and magnesium in the second column, and so on. Just as human family members often have similar looks and traits, members of the element families have similar chemical properties because they have the same number of electrons in their outer energy levels. It was the repeating pattern of properties that gave Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev the idea for his first periodic table in 1869. While listening to his family play music, he noticed how the melody repeated with increasing complexity. He saw a similar repeating pattern in the elements and immediately wrote down a version of the periodic table that looks much like it does today. Noble gases. Look at the structure of neon in figure 6. Neon and the elements below in group 18 have 8 electrons in their outer energy levels. Their energy levels are stable, so they do not combine easily with other elements. Helium, with two electrons in its low energy level, is also stable. At one time, these elements were thought to be completely unreactive and therefore became known as the inert gases. When chemists learned that some of these gases can react, their name was changed to noble gases. They are still the most stable element group. This stability makes possible one widespread use of the noble gases to protect filaments in light bulbs. Another use of noble gases is to produce colored lights in signs. If an electric current is passed through them, they emit light of various colors, orange, red from neon, lavender from argon, and yellowish white from helium. The halogens. The elements in group 17 are called the halogens. A model of element fluorine in period 2 is shown in figure 7. Like all members of this family, fluorine needs one electron to obtain a stable outer energy level. The easier it is for the halogen to gain this electron to form a bond, the more reactive it is. Fluorine is the most reactive of the halogens because its outer energy level is closest to the nucleus. The reactivity of the halogens decrease down the group as the outer energy levels of each element's atom get farther from the nucleus. Therefore, bromine in period 4 is less reactive than fluorine in period 2. Alkali metals. Look at the element family in group 1 on the periodic table. At the back of this book called the alkali metals, so it's all the way to the left. The first members of this family, lithium and sodium, have one electron in their outer energy levels. You can see in figure 8 that potassium also has one electron in its outer level. Therefore, you can predict that the next family member, rubidium, does also. These electron arrangements are what determines how these metals react. So here we're talking about the alkali metals right here. In the previous paragraph, the noble gases was in purple here. The halogens was in group 17 right here. So the neon gases, the noble gases right here, all have a stable outer energy level. They don't like to react with anybody. 
halogens, they need one electron, so they're going to want to react with people because if they can get that one electron, then they'll be happy. The alkali metals have one electron to give, so they want to get rid of that electron so that they'll have less electrons overall and therefore have a stable order energy level as well. So if you're looking for one electron and you're having an extra electron, maybe this group and this group are going to react to form different types of compounds. Wait, I think I see one. If you take sodium and chlorine and put those together, you get sodium chloride, which is NaCl, also known as table salt, which you're going to have on your french fries. Back to the last paragraph in alkali metals on page 167. The alkali metals form compounds that are similar to each other. Alkali metals have one outer energy level electron. It is this electron that is removed when alkali metals react. The easier it is to remove an electron, the more reactive the atom is. Unlike halogens, the reactivities of alkali metals increase down the group. That is, elements in the higher numbered periods are more reactive than elements in the lower numbered periods. This is because their outer energy levels are farther from the nucleus. Less energy is needed to remove an electron from an energy level that is farther from the nucleus than to remove one from an energy level that is closer to the nucleus. For this reason, cesium in period 6 loses an electron more readily and is more reactive than sodium in period 3. So in the alkali metals, it gets more reactive as you go down. In the halogens, it gets less reactive. So fluorine and chlorine are the more, most reactive. It gets less reactive because those elements are further away from the nucleus. Here, being further away from the nucleus means that they're easily to, easier to, to, to attach. Here, being closer to the nucleus means that they're harder to um, remove. So in this, you have the opposite reaction happening with both of those, but they're both wanting to react with each other because one has one to give and one has, needs one to receive that full energy level. Chapter 6, Lesson 1, Reinforcement, Why Do Atoms Combine? Now, Mr. Shane's going to go through this with you because he doesn't want you to get confused when we've broken Chapter 6, Lesson 1 down into two different sections because it's so long and there's specific information to each portion of that section that I don't want you to miss anything. So I'm going to go through each of these parts together. The first part covering what we learned in Lesson 1, Part 1 today, and the second part covered in what would be Lesson 1, Part 2 for tomorrow's lesson. Here at the top of our directions, it says to complete the sentences below using the following terms. Some of the terms may not be used. Number one, an element is stable with eight electrons in its, it's going to be outer energy level. If it's got a full outer energy level, it is stable, doesn't want to react, it's chill, it's good. Number two, the closer a blank is to the nucleus, the electron, sorry, the stronger the, the closer an electron is to the nucleus, the stronger the attractive force. Messed up on that one, but I'll give you that. The closer an electron is to the nucleus, the stronger the attractive force. The electron has a negative charge. The nucleus has an overall positive charge because of the protons. That force is pulling them those together. The stronger they are, or the closer they are together, the stronger that force is. Number three, an atom's blank contains its protons and neutrons. Well, we just mentioned it. The nucleus contains the protons and neutrons because that those protons it has an overall positive charge. Number four. A blank model with dark bands representing energy levels shows where an atom's electrons are most likely to be. Because it's referring to electrons and where they're supposed to be, you're probably thinking, well, that's going to have to do with electron, electron, cloud, electron, dot diagram. It's going to be the electron cloud as the best way to describe that because we don't know exactly where they are. We describe them kind of, they're in this cloud, they're in this area. And we kind of show that with these lines as the different bands and where those should exist. And we learn about the different energy levels that demonstrate that as well. Number five, the chemical symbol for an element surrounded by as many dots as there are electrons in its outer energy level is electron dot diagrams. That's what we're going to break part two of this lesson down into and specifically at the bottom of this page learn how to actually draw those. Number six, columns in a periodic table are known as element families. We learned in our reading that the items that are in these vertical columns all behave the same way. They look the same, just like maybe you and your own family or have similar characteristics or resemblances. Elements have that same type of ability because of the way in which their electrons and protons are laid out. They're called element families in those vertical columns. Number seven, the number of electrons in a neutral atom increases by one as you go from left to right across a period in the periodic table. Those columns are the vertical portions of our periodic table. The period is what goes from left to right across the periodic table in that horizontal fashion. Number eight, each element has a different number of protons and electrons, so each has a different atomic structure. The arrangement of the electrons and protons is what gives the atomic structure its properties, and those properties are what we can understand as scientists on how a, an item is going to react or why 
a element does what it does. Now, number nine kind of summarizes what we learned in today's lesson. It says, explain how the arrangement of electrons in an atom is related to the periodic table. You probably write something like this. The elements in the same column of the periodic table, same group or family, all have the same number of electrons in an outer energy level. So the vertical columns indicate how many electrons are in the outer energy level. That number of electrons in the outer energy level also determines how reactive that item is going to be. So they have all of these common principles together. We learned specifically about the noble gases all the way to the right in our periodic table. Those are completely fine and filled because their outer energy level is full. And we learned about the halogens right next to them that are a lot more reactive. We learned about the alkali metals that are also really reactive. One needing an electron and one being willing to get rid of an electron all so that they have that same outer energy level. Again, I'll read what I should see written down. The elements in the same column of the periodic table, group or family, all have the same number of electrons in the outer energy level. And that outer energy level determines what their reactivity is going to be. That structure is what provides us with that information. Now number 10, you'll be able to come back to this. You don't have to do number 10 today. You're gonna to come back to this and we will practice how to write out the electron dot diagrams for the elements aluminum, magnesium, sulfur, and bromine. So today, just finishing numbers one through nine. We'll come back to number 10 once we finish part two of this lesson.